Please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues forever. Oh, see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Let us pray. Merciful Father, your kindness caused the light of the gospel to shine among us. Use us now as instruments of your love to reach out with the message of salvation to all people. Bless those who labor in the mission fields far off and near and grant success to their witness, that many may be freed from sin. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for this morning's readings. I invite you to follow along on your bulletin insert as we take in the portions of God's Word for this Mission Sunday. We have uh, in our first reading, our Old Testament lesson, Jonah chapter three, verses one through 10, where the Lord had called Jonah and sent him to the, the city of Nineveh once before. And Jonah had in his mind determined that they were too terrible a people to hear the message and he fled the other direction. The Lord uh, used a miracle to chastise Jonah and now, brings him back and gives him the message to share again. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh just as the word of the Lord had commanded. Now Nineveh was a great city to God. It required a three-day walk. Jonah walked through the city for a day, and he called out, Forty more days, and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. The men of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least. When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his leading officials, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat food or drink water. Instead, let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call fervently to God. Let them turn from their evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil way, 
God relented from the disaster which he said he would bring on them, and he did not carry it out. This is the word of our Lord. If you would turn to page 91 in the front of your hymnals, we sing in unison our psalmody for this morning, Psalm number 67. Our second lesson for this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. We read chapter 10, verses 8 through 15. Uh, This also serves as our sermon text for this morning. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we are proclaiming. Certainly, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and it is with the mouth that a person confesses, resulting in salvation. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord is Lord of all, who gives generously to all who call on him. Yes, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one about whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news of peace who preach the gospel of good things. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia. Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. that 
that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Please rise for the reading of this morning's gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel for today is recorded in St. Matthew's account. We read chapter 9, verses 35 through 38 in Jesus' name. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were troubled and downcast, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers into his harvest. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated we continue with the singing of our hymn of the day, hymn 570, O Christian's Haste.
grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have, as I mentioned, our epistle lesson for this morning. I again read an introductory verse. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we are proclaiming. Heavenly Father, sanctify us through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear children of God, through faith in Christ, this morning's focus is on missions. Uh, God's call to take the gospel to places near and places far, uh, the training of people to go and take that message, and the support of ministry, mission, in funding, and in prayer. Uh, when we take a look at, at this idea of missions, over the years I've heard questions uh, from people young and old, and sometimes comments that they make to one another in conversations, and, and the questions go like, well, why doesn't God just use the angels? They could do it quicker than us and probably do a better job. Or, why doesn't God send out a whole bunch of people in loud, slow-flying planes and they can fly low over the people and be pulling a banner behind them and when the people hear the noise, they'll look up and they can read the gospel for themselves. Or, maybe God could make a huge radio tower and transmit the Bible in every language all at once so everyone can hear it in their own language. Or, how come God can't make missions free? These are the kinds of questions that come up. Uh, and in the face of such questions, Paul speaks to us this morning. And he presents to us missions, a biblical teaching with logical backing. Logical backing. I think there's some people that would jump on that idea. Finally, finally get to sit down and, and hammer something out, come to an arrangement. Uh, that kind of thinking uh, needs to be shut down and quickly. When we take a look at God's logic, it's completely different from man's. When the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah, he said, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as crimson, they shall be as wool. The word that the Lord uses here for reason is a courtroom kind of term, something that you would use to describe people proving or showing a fact, not, not a bargaining and compromising with one another to have to have a suitable outcome. And in Luke's writing, the book of Acts, in chapters 17 and 18, he describes Paul as going to the synagogue every Sabbath and reasoning with the Jews. But again, here the word is not mentioned as bargaining or him compromising the gospel until it's palatable to the Jewish people. It is him leading them in a discussion, helping them to understand the promises God had made in the Old Testament about the Savior who was to come, what he was going to do, how he was going to act, and what he was going to accomplish by his unique assignment. He was going to pay for the sins of the world. In his taking on flesh, he was going to take upon himself the assignment the Father had given to be perfect in our place. And he was going to take upon himself the burden and the punishment of all of our sins. We take a look at, at this, this reasoning that mankind <laughs> would hold to. And we see that it conflicts with God's reasoning. The wisdom of God that plan of the Savior has always seemed like foolishness to mankind, though, hasn't it? When Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And the words that 
Paul was inspired to use talk about the thought process of a sinful human being, in his example, a child, and, and that conversation that is used to convince somebody. It talks about a person's interests, their desires, and their will to have their way. And it's the same thing with the logic of sinful mankind, isn't it? It is the same thing. Paul talks about this, and he, he refers to this problem in the verses that precede our text. He looks at the Israelites, the children of Israel, and, and he recognizes that they are using their logic. When Moses had written about the law, he wrote about the righteousness that comes from the law. And, and Paul quotes him as saying, about the righteousness that comes by the law, the one who does these things will live by them. These people, his people, had desired to follow that invitation and to look at this as their way of gaining God's favor and entrance into heaven, but the Lord had never intended that the law was going to serve as a successful option to be saved. In fact, Paul in Galatians quotes Deuteronomy where Moses wrote this. He says, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Our being born sinful human, sinful human beings means that there is no way that we could always keep perfectly all of God's law. In fact, being born sinful points out to us the fact that it's foolish to even try. And yet that is what the Jews had latched onto, that idea that they could use the law as a way of making themselves suitable for entrance into heaven. In fact, in effect, what they were saying to God was, let's sit down together. Let's, let's come up with a plan. Let's make some arrangements here. You will, you will have to accept us according to all of our efforts, especially when you see our good intentions. And, and this is the, thought, the thoughts, the, the reasoning, the actions of sinful mankind. We, uh, we're fortunate, aren't we? God did not leave us to try to come up with our own solution to the problem of sin. Instead, he gave us the solution to that sin that separates us from him in his own son. He begins by pointing out the fact that uh, his logic is not like ours. In Isaiah, God says, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so far my thoughts are above your thoughts. My plans are above your plans. And, and he shares with us that righteousness that comes by faith, not by the law. He says here, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Yes, everyone, and he refers both to the Jew and to the Gentile or Greek, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This righteousness that comes through faith is the solution that God chose to put into effect for all mankind. This is what we have uh, when Jesus took on flesh in the Virgin Mary's womb. He did it so that he could stand in our place. His assignment, completely fulfill the law. He, he obeyed the Father's will his entire life. He went to the cross, and there he paid that payment, made the sacrifice for all the sins of mankind. <coughs> the righteousness that comes by faith was made a reality by his perfect life, by his innocent suffering and death, and by his resurrection from the dead that proved that he is our victorious Savior. 
the righteousness that comes by faith was completely from God for us. We simply believe. We trust because the Holy Spirit works through that gospel to convince us. Uh, faith in this Savior, Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection, results in righteousness. That confession of faith, that good confession that the Holy Spirit enables us to speak, results in salvation for us. This was God's plan. Luther, in his small catechism, talks about this and, and explains just how this kingdom of grace comes to more and more people. He says, God's kingdom comes to us when our Heavenly Father gives His Holy Spirit so that by His grace we believe His Holy Word and lead a godly life now on earth and forever in heaven. God's logic, His perfect wisdom, He wants everyone to be part of His kingdom of grace, to trust in His Son and have life in His name. And St. Paul understood that. He knew what the Lord had done for him as he opened his eyes and helped him see the truth. He saw how the Lord used him to take the good news out to others and how the Spirit worked powerfully to call so many people to faith and life. And at the same time, he realized that the majority of his own nationality, his own people, the Jews, rejected the message because they were they were so fixated on that attempt, on their efforts to have righteousness through the law, that they cast that invitation to have the righteousness of God through faith aside. Uh, what is the answer to this dilemma? That sad observation that St. Paul had was the same sad observation that Jesus had in the gospel as he looked at all these people who were being misled by the leaders of the Jewish faith, uh, sheep wandering without a shepherd. And he told the disciples that this is where we need to focus. We need to bring this salvation to these people. And it is our sad observation, isn't it? We can see masses of people who are unbelievers, who do not confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who are lost in sin and unbelief in our neighborhoods and to the ends of the earth. What is the answer to this dilemma? The answer is missions, isn't it? And that answer demands a response. We take a look at, at missions. Believers go out and share the good news that they have come to know with others. People train to go out and share the good news where we cannot. And we support missions with our prayers and with our funds so that people can go and mankind more and more can find out about their Lord and Savior to, uh, to drive home the importance of missions. Toward the end of our reading, the Apostle Paul sets out a series of questions, displaying God's perfect logic, displaying his divine will that everyone repent of their sins, trust in his Son, and have life in his name. And these, these questions go backwards from the, from the longed-for result to the beginning of the process. Just so you understand this, I'm going to give you an example from, from sinful human logic. A, a person, a young person, approaches the parents and says, if you hear your, your kids bringing this question up to you or this statement up to you in, in days or months or, or weeks to come, remember that they heard it in the sermon and, and act accordingly. They say, I want to marry the love of my life. But how can I marry the love of my life if I don't fall in love? And how can I fall in love with somebody if I don't get to meet them? How can I get to meet them if I don't get to go to this place? And how can I go to this place if you won't let me use the car? 
you can see where this is going, right? person wants so badly to get to a certain place that they're using this very persuasive argument, uh, the same kind of attitude, the same kind of intensity as the person who says, I'll just die if I can't go. But God's desire that people trust in his son and have salvation is even more intense. And so he says, so then, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one about whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news of peace, who preach the gospel of good things. Now we understand that God's will is this that he wants everyone to hear the good news about the kingdom of heaven, the good news of what the Savior has done for them, that he wants them to hear the message so the Holy Spirit can call them to saving faith, so they can have forgiveness and life eternal. This is what God wants. This is his will. Missions. So as you, you're going around church and you happen to see the posters that are up regarding missions from LWMS uh, or we see the videos over the next days and weeks, I want you to, to recognize that these groups, these peoples, whether they're near or far, are all objects at this point of God's wrath. But he wants to shower his grace upon them. And in his wisdom, he's using us believers as the instruments to carry that message. So as you see these maps, as you see these posters and these stories about mission work far and near, I would have you pray that God would open your eyes to see the fields that are white unto harvest. That he would move you to consider how you can support those missions. And that he would move you to thank him for the privilege of sharing with someone else who's in the danger of, of eternal condemnation uh, that good news that has rescued you and me and given us an eternal home with our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Having heard the message, we join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 41 in your hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please rise for prayers. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us that his ways may be known on earth, his salvation among all nations. Loving Lord, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, has given gifts to his church in the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, missionaries, and teachers. According to your will, Raise up more workers and send them into the harvest fields in our land and around the world. By the power of your gospel, strengthen them so that they do not become discouraged but continue in the course you have set before them. Pour out your wisdom on us, O Lord, through the working of your spirit as we train and prepare those who proclaim the everlasting gospel in their own communities and cultures. Help us to point them to the authority of your word 
and to look for success in the witness of your love. Let them see us as their partners in ministry as we work together around the world. Lord God, King of the universe, direct the governments of the world so that we may live quiet and peaceful lives. Protect us from disease, crime, and war. Let freedom of religion flourish so that the gospel may be preached freely throughout the world. Cast down rulers who oppress their people and remove governments that oppose the gospel. Bring relief to Christians who are persecuted and ridiculed. Move us to reach out to the sick and the sad, the lonely and the poor, not only in our family and circle of friends, but also to others as we have opportunity. Turn our smile into a word and then a witness so that sadness and fear might become confidence and joy. Wherever we go, near or far, move us to share the gospel with eagerness and joy. Give us grace to be models to all so that our brothers and sisters might see our good works and glorify you. Plant in the hearts of your people a deeper desire to share the gospel with their lips and their gifts so that many more may come to know and believe the love of your Son. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Heavenly Father, as we gather today, we recognize the blessings we have and we pray for those who have been affected by Hurricane Ian. We ask that you would keep people safe during this time of disaster, that you would move people who are able to go in and give assistance and that you would give the opportunities for people to comfort them with the knowledge of your loving care, not only spiritual uh, care, but also protection and comfort in this physical world. We ask these things in our Savior's name and join in the prayer which he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We join in singing hymn 566, We All Are One in Mission. <laughs>
Please rise. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. Please be seated. We join in singing our closing hymn, hymn 576, Spread, O Spread the Mighty Word. Good morning. Glad you could be with us today. A um, couple of notes. You'll notice that uh, we are having a voters brief gathering after the service today. Uh, the subject purchase of the Evangelical Heritage Version Bibles for the uh, congregation's catechism students. Uh, we also have our October newsletter and our calendar. Um, they are in the back. You can help yourself to one of those. And uh, we, we thought that it would be nice to share the information uh, and, and the theme. We had our LWMS rally on the last Saturday in September. And while that was fresh in some people's minds, uh, to give them a, a reminder and 
to give the fresh information and look uh, that is uh, for those who were not able to attend. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, there are some displays downstairs. Uh, there's information about missions. We have our, our theme for this coming year beginning in 2023 about uh, 100 missions in 10 years. And that is, that is going to be uh, a theme that goes throughout that period of time. Um, I don't know of anything else to announce this morning. Those are the voters thing downstairs. Downstairs, okay. The voters uh, gathering will be downstairs uh, along with the coffee hour. Good combination. <laughs> God bless your day and your week.